So as Ariane mentioned, uh, political decision makers and the academic sector have been brought closer together during the pandemic. But I think the topic of today's discussion is equally relevant because it's about realizing the full potential now of the private sector. We have a very interesting setup today. We actually have two co-moderators. The first one who I would like to welcome on stage is Babette Simon from the Faculty of Health of the University of Paris. She'll take this podium over here. Then we have uh, Uta Jungermann from the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. We'll go around in this order. Following her, we have Kelly McCain from the World Economic Forum. After that, we have Jutta Reinhard Rupp from the Merck Global Health Institute. And of course, to finish up as our co-moderator, we also have Andrea Silvia Winkler. Uh, she comes from the Center for Global Health at the Technical University of Munich, the Center for Global Health at the University of Oslo, and last but not least, the Lancet One Health Commission. And I think we have a full house, a full stage today. So I will let the two co-moderators uh, take the floor. We will come back then earlier, maybe around 20 minutes to leave for Q&A. We'll see you very shortly. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Olivia, for this nice introduction of our panel. Um, up front, a message uh, that unfortunately, uh, Professor Lona Kickbush was not able uh, to join us for private reasons. So we have our three eminent uh, and very knowledgeable panelists with us, and not four. So I have the pleasure to set the scene for you, something that uh, Ilona Kickbush would have done, um, and to give you a little bit uh, the, the broader picture uh, of, uh, uh, of economics, of the private sector within economics, and of course, One Health. So I would like to start really by uh, explaining a little bit about the mission of the WHO Council on the Economics of Health for All that was established in November 2020. I'm not sure whether uh, you know or you, you remember by the WHO Director General in order to, and now I quote, to rethink how value in health and well-being is measured, produced, and distribute it across economy. Another quote, the WHO Council on the Economics of Health for All aims to reframe health. And we now talk about health in general, just to start you off, we're not talking about One Health yet. So health for all as a public policy objective and ensure that national and global economies and finance are structured in such a way to deliver on this very ambitious goal. The Council will aim to create a body of work that sees investment in global and local health systems as investment in the future and not, a short -term, and not as a short-term cost. I think that is a very, very uh, key uh, message. So it is about sustainability. So I think that from this quotation it becomes very clear that we need to radically rethink our economy to achieve health for all and that this must be mission driven. So not really output or growth driven, but mission driven and not depend on profit alone and the eternal growth that we imagine and that is simply not possible and also not sustainable. So there is a fundamental, there's a need for a fundamental shift towards an economy in service. And now we're coming to One Health, multi-species health and their environment. In short, what we understand by One Health. And I give you also a, a definition about One Health in a moment um, that prioritizes sustainability and equity and equity at a global level, but also intergenerational equity and multi-species equity, encouraging all humans, other animals and ecosystems to thrive. So I think that needs to be our common goal. It's about our environment, animals, of course, about us humans, and last but not least, about our planet. And current bl uh, blueprints that support this new notion you may have heard about is the donut economy circular economy or well-being economy. 
I now come back to the private sector because this is what we're here for. The private sector is actually instrumental in this new re uh, rethink and plays an immensely important role in this envisioned economic shift. Without the private sector in, this different, in, his different, in its different forms and shapes, this is simply not possible. And in turn, the long-term sustainability of the private sector depends on healthy people, on healthy animals and healthy ecosystems in which business can thrive. Therefore, sustainability through whatever action is no longer a nice to have but must be fully integrated into the private sector simply for the private sector to survive. I will now, we are doing very good with time. <laughs> it's just uh, 11.30, it's actually time we should have started. So I think we can be a little bit more uh, in depth and we can also give our speakers a little bit more time. Before we start the discussion and before I hand over to you, uh, my dear Babette, I will just give you a short intro into what, uh, into what One Health is and, and what we understand by One Health, because we have so many different concepts these days, um, like eco-health and planetary health, and, and in a way, it's, it's not so different. And what counts really is our joint objective, and it's about the way we view health within the socio-ecological system, and ultimately, of course, to uh, to save our environment and to have an inhabitable planet for our children. So, One Health is an old concept. It has been around for a long time, even in, age, in ancient times and in Egyptian times, One Health elements have already been there. It has been driven very much by the veterinary sector and I think we need to give a lot of credit to our veterinarian, to our veterinary colleagues here uh, because they have really established that concept over the last 150 to 200 years. It was very animal, human, human, animal driven. It was based a lot on zoonotic diseases, but it has actually under, it has undergone a, a, a shift in notion. So since the early 2000s, it has now been applied much broader and the environment has also come in it has been applied now to antimicrobial resistance, to food safety, to different emerging diseases, and of course, not the least, to COVID-19. And COVID-19 has pushed uh, the One Health concept now into the political uh, arena. And you may have heard yesterday, if you were part of the plenary, that there is a quadripartite now that takes on this One Health mission the quadripartite consists of the WHO, the OIE, which is the, the World Organization for Animal Health, and then FAO, uh, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, and then UNEP or UNEP, the UN Program uh, for Environment. And they have uh, now formed this quadripartite. They have also launched already a joint action plan that is online and will be fully uh, accessible in, uh, in, in short time. So overall, just to close here, One Health is actually, it's not a discipline. It's an approach, it's a concept, it's a lens that we should actually put on when we do our projects, when we do our work, when we think about how to move forward. We need to realize that we are all the different types of health. We are inherently interconnected. And this is why we depend on each other. So there can be no human health without animal health and without environmental health. And this is what we have to, to realize. And ultimately, and I will close here, One Health is actually a systems approach. We look a lot at interfaces and we should still do this. And we look at the added value of those interfaces, let's say human and environmental health. Because this is what we need to know. What is the added value of looking at the two types of health together compared to looking at them separately? But ultimately, it's about the socio-ecological system that we depend on. So One Health is a systems approach with an inherent need for equity, holism, interdisciplinarity and cross-sectoral collaboration. So without further ado, I hope we were able to make 
the One Health concept a little bit clearer. But now we would like to talk about the role of the private sector. And Babette, please, over to you. Thank you very much, Andrea, for these important informations ahead. So, good morning also from my side. We are talking now about the private sector's responsibility for healthy societies using a One Health approach. And I'm delighted to introduce and have here as uh, panelists uh, two experts who will give us the perspective of the industry or private sector. So that's uh, Kelly McCain and Jutta Jungemann. So Kelly, let me come to you. So you are head of healthcare initiatives at the World Economic Forum and an expert in global strategy with strong experience and um, great expertise in public-private partnerships, policies, global public health and stakeholder engagements. So, um, as we all know, the environment dominates the most recent list of global risks published by the World Economic Forum. And could you, Kelly, highlight some of the work on health and environment interconnectedness and show us the importance of public-private collaboration to addressing also the related challenges. And we would also be delighted to hear from you what could be an incentive for the private sector to implement such as environmental social governance metrics, or even better, as we heard, a One Health concept. Great, thank you so much for that question, and um, I'm really delighted to be here today. Uh, at the World Economic Forum, I represent only one small portion of what is a quite a large and dedicated group of experts that look at systems change and public-private partnerships. So as part of the he health and healthcare industries, we have seen such an immense shift in how our group of partners that are from both in and outside of the industry are looking at two core areas, which are keeping populations healthy and delivering the best care. And during the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as, uh, as climate change becomes increasingly imperative to consider, we have seen spillover effects in what our partners are thinking about, what they're focusing on, and how they're looking at what is the systems change necessary to design and drive healthcare systems of the future, which include keeping populations healthy. So thinking about how, do, how does the rising temperatures impact future pandemics, as well as overall respiratory health and health in general, and to even thinking about health, health system sustainability. So as, the, as we see an increase in natural disasters, as well as temperatures rising in general, uh, what does that mean for health systems that are already under stress and pressure? So when we think about these, uh, one of the first places that we go is thinking about um, the concept of stakeholder capitalism and shared value. And how is it that we can work with the private sector alongside governments, civil societies, and communities to, to build systems that not only um, provide value for business, but ultimately provide values for the communities in which they sit, which includes uh, how they uh, interact with their employees, how they interact with their communities, how they design their systems and products that they put, um, put out, and uh, again, most importantly, thinking about what is their role in ensuring individuals stay out of the health system, which is really quite immense. And uh, where we've been really seeing some change in how, um, how companies are holding themselves to account is really a refocus on their reporting structures through ESG metrics, through their SDG reports, and um, how we're redesigning and thinking new uh, about how new business models may indeed drive some of this change and moving it out of a corporate social responsibility function. So as they redesign businesses and think about what One Health means, uh, we're really seeing some positive change in um, how the private sector is starting to work with, uh, work with uh, multi-stakeholder groups. Thank you, Kelly. Then um, I am um, interested, Jutta, um, 
to your help. Jutta Ungermann is Senior Manager, Health and Wellbeing at the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. And she has a vast experience in strategic projects engaging global businesses and stakeholders with a focus on advancing global sustainability objectives. And so could you help us to understand uh, what are the incentives and what are the opportunities for businesses or the private sector to drive positive health outcomes for people and the planet? You just mentioned it a little bit, but I think you could even get a little bit more deeper in it. And I have a second question. Um, where do you see the entry points for the private sector into global health in general and in one health in particular? Okay. Um, thank you very much and also an uh, absolute pleasure to, to be here today. Maybe just a few words about the World Business Council for Sustainable Development from the outset because I'm not sure how familiar you are with us as an organization. But we're a CEO-led organization of 200 uh, businesses working on sustainable development or a transition to a sustainable world. And we have this vision of nine plus billion people living well within, the, within planetary boundaries by 2050. And as you said, we do believe that business has a key role and responsibility to play in this transition uh, and scaling up sustainable solutions on the most pressing environmental and, and social uh, challenges. So to answer your question, I guess um, I always like to start with the SDGs um, simply because they are the global sustainability agenda. And obviously SDG 3 around good health and well-being play, gives health and well-being a very central role uh, in, in this agenda, uh, in sustainability, in sustainable development. Uh, obviously, um, it doesn't stop with SDG 3. There health cuts across all of these 17 SDGs. And what does that mean for the economy? Obviously, we've heard about it before. There's a very strong correlation between health and well-being and economic growth. Uh, in simple terms, good health drives economic development and enables people to live better, longer, and be productive in the first place. The lack thereof obviously impedes all of this. And COVID-19 has been the most forceful uh, reminder uh, of that relationship. So basically, health and well-being are the foundations upon which societies and economies thrive. Now, what does that mean more specifically for businesses? Um, it means that the business case for supporting health and well-being is simply becoming a business imperative. Uh, it's becoming undeniable, the, the business case. And some of those entry points or drivers uh, behind this is that we see um, health and well-being become a very important factor for simple things such as acquisition and retention of talent. It also becomes a question of reputation and brand value. Um, it, it's a question of improved business performance because the, least produ the less productive people are, the less productive you are as a business. So it becomes a question of future-proving your business. It becomes a question of simply building business resilience in the face of increasing risks and threats. Um, and obviously, when it comes to health, um, companies also want to stay ahead of an evolving regulatory environment. Um, and we've heard it about it just now about ESG, environmental, social and governance, ESG performance. It becomes a question for companies to, to simply gain access to capital because investors are asking about these questions. They're asking, they're having, it's becoming a critical consideration for investors, for shareholders in all sectors. To, to really focus on some of the social issues uh, the pandemic has brought to light. Um, so health, we see it as, as a core component of that S in ESG. Uh, and it's really moving into the center of the conversation. So that makes the business case, first of all, undeniable. Now, what are the opportunities then for business to drive positive health outcomes? Um, businesses simply um, influence critical drivers of health and well-being through the work people do, through what we consume, how we live. So there's a role for businesses across sectors um, to take that as an opportunity, but also as, as, a, as a responsibility 
to promote health and well-being through their operations, through their business activities, through their products and services, but also to cultivate a mindset that is actually geared towards preventing disease and promoting health in the first place. Um, and the way we've been looking at this is you can always start with your own. You start with yourself first. You start thinking about embedding a kind of culture of health and well-being into your workplace. And WHO recognizes the workplace as a priority setting for health promotion in, in the 21st century. We spend a third of our life at work. So obviously health and well-being needs to be fully embedded in the workplace in the first place. Uh, because then you can really encourage employees, not just, well, you, you, you nurture health and well-being in the workplace and move away from just preventing harm. But it also then means that you encourage people to take that mindset home to your family and to your friends and so on. The second, I guess, opportunity is then to think about how to support healthier lifestyles. So the biggest opportunities here is really about, I mean, health gains you, you, you derive from lifestyle changes. So encouraging improved lifestyle habits, encouraging or providing healthier, uh, healthier choices, in particular in nutrition, mobility, and in consumer products uh, that help people to live better um, in the first place. And then, of course, ultimately through that, you reduce pressures on, on health systems um, uh, as sort of a, a final, final objective. And then uh, another avenue for businesses to explore is to think about how businesses from all sectors can actually strengthen health systems, health system resilience. Because what we see is obviously that health systems underpin the operations of many economic sectors. And in reverse, um, health systems depend on many critical infrastructure sectors to, to operate. Uh, and the pandemic has shown this. So there's a question of how to exchange know-how innovative capabilities, um, stakeholder networks, um, and what sort of the unique um, expertise businesses can bring to the table in identifying health system resilience gaps and then developing strategies to close them. And this is again where the role of collaboration is so, so important. Mm. And I guess the last avenue um, is simply to think about health, planetary health, to really accelerate action on climate, on nature, but also on equity, because it's a triple crisis, health cuts across that. And if we apply a health lens, um, I think business can better understand that relationship and identify and prioritize actions that generate co-benefits for people and, and planet. Thank you very much. And I hand over to you, Andrea. Well, thanks a lot for those uh, very elaborate um, statements and, and succinct statements as well. Um, I think we've only just starting really to, to uh, harness the full potential you're to write. And it, it gives me an exceptional great pleasure <laughs> to introduce you, Jutta. So Dr. Jutta uh, Reinhard Rupp is a biologist by training and she has more than 20 years of professional experience in biotech and pharma industry. She established access to health and access to global health at Merck over the past 12 years and uh, is now leading the Merck Global Health Institute with a mission to develop sustainable health solutions for the most vulnerable populations in low and middle income countries. So Jutta, I mean, this in itself is such a great achievement. Uh, without further ado, but just like to ask you, where do you see the best entry points for the private sector into global health in general and more uh, particularly for, uh, for One Health. Um, and then I have a second question for you before we go to uh, the second round with the other panelists. So if you answer that you. one first, it would be great. Uh, thank you, Andrea. And while listening to the colleagues, I thought, you know what? I confirm all what you are saying. <laughs> this, is, this is exactly uh, what's happening. And yes, I'm more than 20 years in the private sector um, and there, what I'm observing is really a change, a change. And we, we need more change, but let me maybe briefly explain what has happened already. And uh, yeah, I'm in the global health uh, arena, in the global health sector of, of our company, Merck. Um, it's, a, it's the German Merck. I always have to say this because there's the American MSD. Um, and yeah, there is a history, but there are unfortunately two pharmaceutical companies with the same name. 
So the private sector, in my opinion, has an important role to play. First of all, to answer your question in global health, um, because we bring really know-how in, in R&D, in product development, in regulatory, in manufacturing. Um, and I have a concrete example, and maybe we talk about it a bit later. Um, and especially when it comes to infectious diseases, and that's where I guess you were referring to one health concept comes from, originally from infectious diseases, um, especially in infectious diseases, I think uh, the private sector has to play a role, has to be at the table. And um, uh, what, what we are looking at are what, what is called the most neglected um, tropical diseases. Um, so again, in, we all do this in partnerships. I heard it several times. There is no way one of us can, can solve uh, these complex problems. Uh, uh, problems. So one health now, so this is global health, and Andrea kindly invited me to this panel and said, Jutta, we talk about one health. I said, oh my God, what do I have to do with animals? Um, except that, of course, in a pharmaceutical company, uh, we talk a lot about animal welfare, which is probably a different topic, but very clearly infectious diseases, of course, uh, are linked to, to animal health, to coming from an animal uh, reservoir, but for a company, we, we do not talk about one health in the company as a concept, but we do talk about sustainability. And when I look at our four business priorities for the company, and I had to, to look really in detail again, I was surprised that sustainability is a strategic pillar. It is so prominent. And it is so clear that as a company, you can only create value on the long term when you work in this, in this ecosystem of environment, society, and governance. So the famous ESG that we heard already. So what does it mean exactly for, for us? Merck is a family-owned company. So imagine it's the oldest company, pharmaceutical company in the world more than 350 years old, 70% um, in the hand of the family, but also 30% shareholders. And that's what we heard investors are asking about, what are you doing with respect to ESGs? And there are a lot of indicators that we are measuring. What do we want to achieve by, by 2030? For One Health, I would say, from our perspective, we are very strong on the human health and the environment side where, where we uh, want to contribute. And I stop here. <laughs> yeah, and we have, of course, uh, a second question. But just to clarify, because I think this is so important when we talk about uh, One Health, that many companies will say, well, what have I, what has my yeah. company got to do with One Health? And now you mentioned the, the ESG, so environment, sustainability, and governance, right? You, you mm -hmm. explained to me yesterday. And I, I replied back, that, okay, but this is One Health. So for One Health, it's not necessary to always have the three types of health in it at, uh, at equal terms, but it, you can choose basically what you need for that purpose. So, um, of course, animal health is always important, but if you look at human and environmental health a bit closer for a specific purpose, that also is one health. Yep. So, very short question, um, Jutta, before then we go to the second round uh, with the other panelists. What is in there really for the private sector? So, why do you think, right, yeah. I mean, Merck is doing it already, yeah. but why is it important to keep to, to, to keep yeah. on doing it and not to let yeah. go. Yeah. I think there is no choice. We, as you say, we are in it because we are part of it. So to do business well, you, you, need, to, to be in a, you, need, you need to have a license to operate. Uh, and I think this license to operate means you are not in a bubble and you think about profits, profit, profit. No. You are dealing with countries, with patients. You have an obligation. We, we heard social responsibility. That was a bit the concept in the past. We do not talk any longer about 
social um, responsibility because it was a bit aside. Now, it's sustainability integrated in the company strategy. It comes from our board and we, we are all part in it. I have objectives where I have to contribute to these sustainability um, uh, objectives. So on a, sh on a short term, and I'm just referring to the current um, really geopolitical situation in Europe, you can imagine a company, uh, how much we are dependent on energy and, and how much we are now pushed to find solutions to get more and more independent of, um, of the gas, especially the gas is, is the problem. Um, and on a longer term, I mean, environment is including waste management, energy uh, consumption, um, but it also gives on a longer term, and we heard this as well, uh, an interesting aspect to, um, to attract talents. Um, companies are looking for talents, and it's not so easy because there's a younger generation that is driven by purpose, not so much about, you know, what is my salary, what is my purpose, and what are you doing mm -hmm. as a company um, for, for the society. So there, there are very interesting aspects in it. And um, uh, as I said in the beginning, no discussion if we are in or out. Uh, there, it's very clear we are part of it. Yeah, and that's such a clear statement, Jutta. Thanks so much. I just hand back over our second round for approximately 10 minutes. It needs to be a shorter round to my co-moderator. Babette, please. But a very important question. I would like to talk about economic models. I think we have to do that if we are talking about the private sector. So um, I think it's probably for all of us here in this audience clear, we cannot have infinite growth on a finite planet. It doesn't come together. But that's what's going on at the moment, looking at the G GDP growth. So. Kelly, um, I think um, the World Economic Forum did the great reset proposal for wide-ranging changes. I like a lot. So um, how could we manage to get a One Health-friendly economic model or economic models into the private sector? What economic models exist and maybe we don't have that much time. Could you refer on that in a short period of time? But I think it's a very important question for all of us. Yes, thank you so much for that question. And I think I heard uh, many threads from the colleagues on the panels. But again, when we think about economic models, one of the big focus of the World Economic Forum over the last few years has been the shift to stakeholder capitalism and having working with our partners from both the private sector as well as the public sector and thinking about investment not as a short-term cost but as a, a long-term benefit and really at the core of the stakeholder capitalism is uh, making sure that planetary health is at the center of this and knowing that the health of the planet is core to the health of the global economic systems and in an ideal state all decisions that are being taken should the planet should be optimized and then any decision made by stakeholders but then you have an e equal interconnectedness of people and thinking about how the health of people in one society affects the entire uh, global footprint as we saw in the COVID pandemic. And that it's absolutely incumbent on all of us to, um, again, optimize these, these, these decisions. So in thinking about economic models, we would like to see and have been promoting to see that shift where, uh, again, both the private sector and the public sector are thinking about this one health concept where planet and people have the same interconnectedness and really we can't have a healthy, healthy facing economies and healthy uh, facing societies without thinking um, about both. Thank you, Kelly. And um, Uta, uh, last year, the World Business Council for Sustainable Development launched the Vision 2050. I think also a very important um, paper, Time to Transform actually. I mean, that's what we are talking here about, and which, to realize a world within planetary boundaries by 2050. How can business lead, or the private sector lead this transformation? And uh, very short, what are the pathways? 
Yeah, no, absolutely. So Vision 2050 sets out this vision of nine plus billion people living well within planetary boundaries. Living well means that dignity and rights are respected, that basic needs are met, that people have equal opportunity. Living within planetary boundaries means that we need to stabilize global warming at 1.5 degrees. It means that natural systems are protected, restored, used sustainably. And of course, there's more to it. Um, in order to make that actionable and to break that vision down, we have set out nine transformation pathways, um, articulating the key transitions that we need to see and the action areas that business can drive forward. Some of these transformation pathways include, of course, the transformation of our energy systems, um, transportation and mobility, our living spaces, um, products and materials, financial services, water and sanitation, food, food systems change, food systems transformation, but of course also health and, and well-being. There are a couple of programs that we run, that we run in order to uh, operationalize this. Um, this includes, for instance, our program and food reform for sustainability and health, our SOS 1.5 program, which is really about emission reductions and decarbonization of value chains, but also, um, and that bridges the the environmental side to the social side, we've launched this business commission to tackle inequality, to really mobilize a business community uh, behind the inequality agenda and shared prosperity for, for all. Thank you. I, I ask a very important question for all of us. I think there are also probably, I know, people in the audience who are interested. Um, what kind, and I think that's important too, we talked about partnership, what kind of support or economic architecture are needed to support the businesses to implement a One Health approach? Mm. Studio <laughs> That is your second question. It's an important question, yeah. I think, um, to all of us here. No, I think exactly what, what is really needed is a much stronger dialogue between the public and private sector. Um, we've heard it, nobody can do this alone, no company can do this alone, no government can do this alone. So there is much greater need uh, for dialogue and effective partnership and collaboration between the, the public and private sectors in order to create that public policy and regulatory environment that sets out clear and, 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 and an ambitious roadmap um, to, to realize this. It doesn't go without each other. Yeah, thank you very much. I think that's a partnership you also mentioned, and it is. which is definitely yeah. important. Yeah. Otherwise, we yeah. can't trans yeah. do any transformation. So I hand back to Andrea. <laughs> thanks, thanks a lot, uh, Babette. We are doing very good with time, but I need to announce, unfortunately, that Jutta needs to leave a little bit early because she will moderate another session. Uh, she will have to leave at a quarter past. Mm -hmm. um, but we are already well into our second round, Jutta, and you can take actually some time now to explain about this example that you oh. were mentioning. Okay. Um, and uh, because we have already elaborated how Merck is actually integrating One Health. Yeah. And we have found that uh, we actually talk about the same thing, but we're using maybe different, different. names. Yeah. So ESG yes. and One Health seems to be pretty much aligned. Yes, yes. So this one example, and, and then also to tell us what Babette has just uh, mentioned, what support do you need? What yeah. do you need, but not just support from partners, but also political yeah. support, maybe regulatory support, uh, legis legislation, etc. So take your time. I, I would say uh, you have 10 minutes um, to elaborate before you have to leave us. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Thanks a lot, Andrea. Yeah, the, the example I wanted to provide, and it fits very nicely to the partnership uh, model, um, we started 10 years ago a public-private partnership on a very specific question. Um, we, we work on schistosomiasis, it's a um, neglected tropical disease, and that's our next panel, if I may advertise for that, <laughs> at 12.30. Um, but we have, a, we have a treatment for school children, adults. We did not have a treatment for very young children, so the so-called preschoolers, and even younger but they also get infected. Um, so we looked at what we have as treatment. It's called praziquantel, and we said, oh, let's do a pediatric formulation. And when we came with this proposal to, at that time, our, our board, they looked at it and they said, well, that's nice. Um, yeah, 
uh, that's needed. We see the medical need, but you cannot do it uh, alone because you, you do not have the expertise to work in Africa. You do not have the disease expertise. That was true. So that was our motivation to ask partners to join, and, and they did. And um, it was not just a pediatric formulation. It became a huge program. I think today we are 15 partners. We have the product in hands. Uh, we have done all the clinical development. We are just now in the phase to bring it to regulatory, to, to submit it. We have huge discussions on how to provide access. This is getting even more difficult than developing the product. Um, so what has it to do with, with One Health? Um, Praziquantel has a history. It came, it came out of veterinary research. It, it is still used if you have dogs and cats and you need to deworm them, you will see <clears throat> there's praziquantel in it. So it is used for, it came out of the veterinary field. We were, and maybe that's a bit embarrassing to say, but we were pushed, of course, as pharmaceutical companies to also <clears throat> test it in human uh, use for schistosomiasis. Now we, we, are, we are looking into more drugs, in Chesto because we have only praziquantel. This is, uh, I mean, unthinkable in other diseases. We have more drugs in the pipeline, so to say, and now we turn it around. We go back to the veterinary field and uh, we ask them, are you interested to test our drugs in, in, in your field? What do we need? What kind of support do we need uh, for One Health? I think it is really about this dialogue. I, don't, I can't see the audience. I w was interested how many people from the private sector are here. I have the feeling when I'm here, I'm talking to myself, and that's, that's not the way it should be. Um, it need, you need to activate, I mean you, we all need to activate uh, the private sector, and I think there are good opportunities. There are so-called CEO roundtables. There are pharmaceutical associations. Um, but they, they talk among themselves, and then here we talk a bit among ourselves. So this dialogue needs to happen, and I know that the World Economic Forum is doing a great job in bringing this together, but we need more, for, especially for the One Health concept. Um, yeah, and um, it, it has to be ingrained in, in strategies for, for companies, right? If you call it One Health or sustainability, I, I would not fight for that <laughs> so much, but I think it, it's this mindset <clears throat> that needs to, to shift. Yeah, no, thank you very much, Jutta. Um, I, th I think you have to leave most likely now. Um, so I'm not sure, Babette, if we want to, thanks a lot, Jutta, it was a pleasure. If we want to open for questions and answers now, yes. and I hand over to you to do that. I think that's a, Great idea, but I think we have even, uh, besides the uh, uh, World Economic Forum, also the World Business Council, who is also doing that in partnership. So we are very happy to have these two organizations here who support uh, the private sector to go that way of transformation. So I, I uh, can't appreciate that enough that you are here. and. Uh, uh, I think it's very important that we all open each other for dialogue. And that's what I'm doing now. So I have the pleasure to open um, the floor for questions. I think, Olivia, you take over, right? <laughs> We have about 20 minutes left, but I know that you all want to make some closing statements at we, the end. We have still a statement, so maybe two questions, Olivia? We, we, let's, see, let's see how we go. We can take two or three questions from the floor. Uh, who would like to start? Maybe raise your hand. We have, yes, in the white there. Thank you, thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, that's very good. So I, was, um, I have a question regarding demand or consumers, users, how, however they, they can be called. And uh, is from your perspective, from the different um, sectors that you represent or that you know about, what do you think it takes for business models to actually change? 
having demand in mind, consumers, users in mind. And the context of my question has to do with the fact that, you know, we have very great examples of uh, circular economy, uh, successful cases, a sharing economy. And it seems to me that there are some um, sectors that are particularly well suited for that. So you see that in transport, like sharing bikes and sharing cars. And it seems that uh, there is now a generation who doesn't really want to own things. So that's very good to stop this um, infinite grow into a um, finite planet that I think is a very uh, good way to put it. So what do you think it takes for other sectors, and I'm, 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 it's bad that, um, our, that Utah had to leave, but what does it mean in, in other sectors, like pharmaceutical and sharing economy in other sectors? So what, what do you think about that? Thank you so much. We can keep this question open to, to both speakers. Kelly, would you like to yes, take over? Yes, I can, I can start. I think maybe one, um, does it the work? microphone a little bit more. Just yeah, yes. the mouse. Okay. I think one of the main things that we've seen about this is it is very important that there's both a push and a pull uh, to create these partnerships. So when we are setting up partnerships on our platform, this is one of the very conscientious areas that we look at in thinking about what's the demand signal, who's going to be the recipient of this, and what's the space in the market. And once we have, once we identify those pieces, another thing that is, I think, really critically important is when we're building these public-private partnerships that they are co-created between the public sector and the private sector, because that allows for um, that. That really allows for dialogue about what's the shared value, what are the shared incentives, and how can the public sector help create the regulatory environments and the policies that will incentivize innovation. And how can the private sector help come in and help fill some of these gaps, both usually in, um, in scale, in capabilities, and uh, especially in the, in the context of global health, which is how I would really see one, in one health model functioning in a similar, in a similar vein. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with, uh, with Kelly. Um, and also just on the demand side, I think we can increasingly see a shift in, in consumer demand. So there are more and more studies coming out that show that consumers or health, health is becoming the most important factor for consumer choices. And with that, of course, companies have an incentive to, to change and to reformulate their products, to rethink how, um, yeah, how, to, how to change their, their product lines, their service lines, and, and so on. Um, and with, with regard to the question around the circular economy, um, yeah, there are some sectors that lend themselves much easier to it. But I think um, in a resource-constrained world, this is really now starting to trigger down through, through, all, through all types of uh, economic, uh, economic sectors, simply because um, the, the challenges are so big uh, and ev every sector intersects with another. It's not really... Um, a chain, uh, a value chain. It's more of a web and everybody depends on one another and with understanding that, um, yeah, it, it becomes uh, a question of, of being able to sustain your business, to run your business 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now anyway. So it's about future-proofing your business and I think that really is starting to, um, or companies are really starting to understand that, no matter in, in what, what sector. Now, I understand the gentleman in blue also had a question. Yes. Yeah, th thank you very much for, for uh, the panel. It was very enlightening. Um, maybe following up on, on the previous question a little bit, but uh, related to one of the topics that you mentioned um, about equity, um, I have kind of a double question. So how do you think that businesses can actually introduce equity into their core and into their, their strategy because I think that this is one of the, of the important problems that we see a lot and especially that a lot of the um, like most often than not the private sector is driving inequity so how can businesses actually incorporate equity into their core and their strategy and how can this happen not just at the global level but as well at the local level 
Um, that's a that's a really really good question, and it's actually one of those questions that we're, that we're still trying to really figure out and find the right answers to. And this is why we have launched um, this business uh, commission to tackle inequality, really understand the key levers that business has um, at their disposal um, to to do this. Obviously, the first one is always about respecting human rights and actually starting there, um, and there are guiding principles for for doing so. Um, I'm, I'm not the expert in this field, so, um, but I can refer you <laughs> appropriately. Uh, but then also, I guess, um, there's a question of, um, or there's increasing, increasing momentum for diversity, equity and inclusion. It's another way. Uh, and then again, the question of health and well-being comes. And I guess in health and well-being, you have to start thinking about different dimensions of health and well-being. So companies, I think, traditionally have thought about occupational health and safety first. But really, that definition is expanding and going further into thinking about physical health, mental health, social well-being, but also financial well-being. And then you also, of course, start um, again with um, sort of broader equity and equality um, issues. It's a very complex uh, issue indeed. And maybe, Kelly, would you like to add? Yes. Uh, and this is uh, also to the World Economic Forum. This is an issue. A little bit the microphone that we... We've been uh, focusing on this issue uh, quite substantially, and uh, we gather our stakeholders really closely around thinking about that issue, is how, how do they redesign their businesses and redesign their strategies with equity at the core. And where we've really seen progress is in three key areas, and one of them is activating leaders. So finding ways for leaders to make the commitments that they need to make, and then actually follow through at both the CEO level and the board level and thinking about the policies that they make in their business, thinking about their um, HR practices, which we talked about earlier, hiring, talent, retention, equity needs to be at the core of those decisions. The second is thinking about scaling innovation, which, which uh, addresses the local to global, global to local. There are such good learnings that are happening in silos of programs that may be working or programs that have had success on both the global level and the local level that can be scaled or tried in different contexts. Um, and we've been seeing quite a bit of knowledge sharing across our global stakeholder community and uh, some, of these, um, some of these programs coming into place. And I think the third area, which is one, again, that is a longer term journey, and I think to a core tenant of some of the One Health work and thinking about is measuring. So how can businesses hold themselves to account and how can they measure their progress? Measuring carbon footprint is a uh, relatively straightforward, but measuring health impact and human health is, um, is a whole different arena that uh, I know that is something that we're looking into um, just to ensure as to what, what you can't measure, you can't uh, evaluate, and it makes it hard to invest in. So thinking about these three areas uh, across, across both the public and private sectors. I hope that answered your two-pronged question. So we have time for around one or two more questions. Um, anyone in the audience would like to ask? Yes, in the suit. Thank you very much for this, uh, for this panel. Uh, the private sector is famous for having good plans and somebody mentioned 1.5 degrees. I guess you all know the recent IPCC report on the sense of urgency. What can the private sector bring in the so-called dialogue between the public and the private? Because with such an urgency, it needs more than a dialogue. It needs some decisions. Thank you. Yeah, it's, a, it's about time. It's a very important question. We don't have much time anymore. So who would like to start? Uh, or Kelly? Yes, I can answer this briefly. From what we have seen, uh, where the private sector is really strengthening on these global health dialogues, is their ability to bring scale to innovation and their ability to innovate with speed. And uh, oftentimes, uh, our, our colleague from Merck was speaking about this earlier and thinking about bringing new pharmaceuticals to the market. Uh, private sector can de-risk some of these investments and get it, uh, get it quite, a, quite a ways to, towards the approval line. Would you want to add something or? Yeah, I think absolutely speed, urgency, it's all uh, absolutely clear. Uh, I think though that generally speaking, the private sector is 
slightly faster than some governments. So I think it only goes in conjunction. Again, um, governments can't do it without the private sector and the private sector cannot do it without the right policies and regulations in place. So the Paris Agreement is there. Um, it is probably also a very strong health um, agreement in the bottom line. And I think governments are also in the responsibility to really see this through and actually deliver on that agreement together with, with the private sector. So I think, yeah, it only goes together. That's the answer, really. Now, does anyone in the audience have a final burning question they need to get off their chest? I just have a quick look around. Okay, if not, then I think that it's time that we move on to the closing section. Um, I think it would be great to hear from um, Andrea. Do you want to give the closing remarks and then or do, we can go through the closing statements as well from the speakers so they get a final word in? Yeah, no, thank, thank you very much. There are no questions online as well. Um, no, we're working with the questions from the audience right, here. Right. Excellent. So um, the final session now is really that you would like to hear a very short statement, a take home message from um, our two panelists. Uh, something, I mean, you can take, we're really good with time, you can take a minute um, to elaborate on what do people in the room and also people uh, listening um, and watching from outside, what do you want them to take home? So maybe, um, Kelly, you go first, and then uh, Uta, you follow. That's great. And again, thank you, everybody. I've um, enjoyed sharing some insights uh, today and, and really enjoyed speaking about the One Health concept. I think what my, really big, what my big takeaway is and what I think about and what we think about when we do our work at the World Economic Forum is, again, thinking about how public-private partnerships are really a core piece to solving many of these global challenges and, uh, and to designing systems of the future. And uh, again, thinking about what role every institution has to play and that the COVID-19 pandemic really showed us that every private sector company and every public sector institution, whether or not they view themselves this way as a health company and has responsibility for uh, promoting and ensuring health and wellness. So with this new point of view and this new era of coming out of the COVID-19 pandemic and uh, facing some of the geopolitical crises that we are currently, it's going to become increasingly critical, again, for everybody to uh, share responsibility and um, move a One Health concept forward. Well, thanks a lot, Kelly. And Jutta, what would you like to say? I think... Um in one sentence, I'll explain that a little further, but basically in one sentence, I think health, uh, One Health, health um, has not been used enough yet, or has been the most underutilized argument, if you will, to drive action on the planetary crisis that we're in. So knowing that the planetary health crisis, climate change, nature loss, inequality, and so on, is a health crisis, I think health is really the argument that connects all of it together and really can drive accelerated action. Um, from a business perspective, I think sustainability has really been driven in the past through operational efficiency arguments, arguments of risk mitigation, uh, reducing your greenhouse gas emissions, reducing your environmental footprints, which is all absolutely imperative. But I think um, health and understanding those health implications that we're seeing from climate change, nature loss, and so on, this breakdown of our natural systems um, is really the, the main argument now to, to connect all the dots and really drive um, action at scale. Um, so it, it also resonates with people much easier because people are more likely to take action on something that's good for them and just good for somebody else or the planet, which is a much bigger concept. So I think health is, in the end, the, the winning argument in, in, in our view. <laughs> thanks, thanks a lot, uh, Uta. I think that's a very nice statement. It's a winning argument. So One Health should be our winning, winning argument. We are only at the very, very beginning. And uh, Babette will now summarize the most important points. And of course, this is only the first step, right, Babette? We will be back and we have to do many more discussions and we need action. This is also what our two panelists just made clear. We need action. And we don't have time to. So first and foremost, 
most. I would like to express, even though Jutta left, uh, my great appreciation to the panelists. You were brilliant. <laughs> and thank you for your expertise, in particular, your passion. I also could experience in, in the preparation of that panel. And uh, I think that's very important. Without that passion, uh, one can't move anything. It was fabulous to explore with you the private sector's responsibility to engage in healthier economy along a One Health concept with the objective to building healthy societies. I think that's all about the need to change the economic architecture to change the rules of the game, to also provide the business community and the private sector with guidance, what you both companies do, on how to lead all of this transformation the world urgently needs, and the need for a robust partnership with the private sector. The private sector is the key player in the operationalization of One Health. And that was clear from the beginning on that 95% of the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, cannot be achieved without actively having business step up. And Dr. Tedros, WHO's message for last month World Health Day was, I quote, we all must choose to change course. We can create, we can create societies, economies and products that nurture health, put health into the center and well-being and stop subsidizing those that destroy it. And Today, there are unfortunately only few courageous companies thriving by giving more than they take. I quote here Paul Polman. And these companies operate under a long term benefit of all their stakeholders, not shareholders, stakeholders and are not focused on shareholders. And the reality is, and I come to the point to the Q&A, uh, the, the person in the Q&A mentioned, the reality is, whilst we all might be moving in the right direction, we are simply not moving at the speed and scale that is needed. That's why we are here and we planned that panel. We are getting impatient. So, as Andrea said, the first step is done, but there is a lot to do. But it is worth going for it, going for a healthy planet, because it benefits us all, and we do need it desperately. So, my deepest gratitude goes to all who attended our panel session. Stay safe and healthy. Take care of yourself and those around you, and don't forget to take care of our planet. Be yourself. Change what you want to see in the world. You have to do the change. I hand now over to Andrea. It was a great pleasure co-moderating with you, indeed, and I have a warm thank you to you, Olivia, for, under, for supporting us. Thank you very much <laughs> to everyone. So, we know all the you. circumstances required a little bit of flexibility today. No, yeah, no, but thank you very much. There's not much more to say. We won't finish on time, and we are really on the spot, uh, on time. Uh, what a really wholehearted and a very warm thank you to the panelists and also to Jutta in absentia and also to you, uh, Babette. And I really hope to move that important topic forward together. Thank you very much. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Thank you.